Blessed is God, my rock, who trains my hands to grapple and my fingers for battle. My kindness, my castle, my tower, my secret tunnel, and my self-assurance. He degrades my people under me. God, what is a mortal soul for you to gaze upon it? The issue of a soul for you to purpose it. A soul is like an exhalation whose days are like a passing shadow. God, ramp the cosmos and come down. Tap the mountains and make them royal. Cast lightning bolts to scatter them. Shoot flaming arrows to consume them. Reach low to seize me and lift me from the maelstrom of the stranger whose mouth lies, whose right hand is guile. God, I will sing you a new song. I will extol you on the ten-string harp. You save kings. You set free your servant David from the wicked blade. Save me and set me free from the stranger's descendant whose mouth lies, whose right hand is guile. May our sons be like seedlings stretching up in their youths. May our daughters be like chiseled corner pillars of great houses. Let our silos be full. Let our flocks multiply from thousands to tens of thousands. Unburden our nobles. No breaches, no banishments, no weeping where we gather. Glad are a people ordered so. Glad are a people whose God is the Lord. Hi, I'm John Sluter. Thank you for joining me in this discussion of Psalm 144. Sometimes, in order to try to enter into the psalm, I try to imagine who the author might be, what his circumstances might have been. And so let me start with this speculation so that I can use it and we can use it together as a vehicle to try to enter imaginatively into the mind of the writer. I picture him as somebody who survived the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 587 BC. I imagine him seeing a lot of suffering and I imagine him having been left behind with others like Jeremiah. I imagine him being disappointed both in the destruction of Jerusalem, that's an understatement, but also in what he saw among those who stayed behind with him. These included some plotting and scheming and murder because the Babylonian king left a governor in charge, a good man, a wise man, but perhaps somewhat a naive man. Maybe you had a little bit too much courage on the occasion that he agreed to meet with a particular fellow countryman after he had been warned by a prophet that that countryman planned to kill him. And kill him he did. The writer is going to pour his heart out to God. He's had some rough experiences. He's going to say some rough things. So before he gets to that, maybe to dispose God favorably toward him, or maybe just a sign of good breeding, a sign of politeness, he's going to praise God. 
he's going to discuss the things that God has done for him in the past, the kindness that God has shown to him. He praises God. He says, Blessed is God my rock, who trains my hands for trains my hands for war, trains my hands to grapple. I'm reading this. I have to wear my glasses. And so forth. I had to make a choice in this translation. Some translations say when describe God as my kindness, my castle, things like that. And other translations, instead of saying kindness, say strength. Many scholars put strength instead of kindness here because the words in Hebrew are very similar and they assume that over time the text has been corrupted and strength makes more sense in context. But I have a bias toward veering toward the more difficult translation if I can justify it because I think that's part of what I encounter in the psalm, these mysterious little twists, these turns, these little nuggets that you have to wrestle with. I tend to, if I can, choose, the, uh, to, choose to translate the word in a way that's more problematic, and then I try to solve the problem. And I think it is justifiable, because if this translation makes one part of this verse seem to clash with its near neighbors. It acts as a prologue to the rest of the psalm because as we proceed, as one proceeds through the psalm, one encounters a variegated emotional landscape. And so these early verses act as a prologue to the rest of the poem. Also, kindness is strength. And maybe that's one of the secret nuggets, one of the little messages that the psalmist is conveying by tucking in this, this uh, kindness with these other praises focused on strength. Now, at, at this point, there's another textual fork in the road. Here the line that I choose to translate. He degrades my people under me. There are a couple of differences here with some translations. My people versus people. It's a huge difference in meaning, but only the difference of a little suffix on the end of the noun which is translated as people. Some uh, texts have it, some don't. And so really the translator has to choose between different texts. Um, and the other difference is the, the word that I choose to translate as degrade. He degrades my people under me. I've seen one translation say humbles. Um, other translations say he tramples my peoples or tramples peoples under me. I choose degrade because I'm interpreting this as being from a person who is left behind in or around Jerusalem after the Babylonians took others in exile. I'm laying hold of the historicity of the event in which the Babylonians tended to take the highly educated and the highly skilled and left the people without particular skills, the more unskilled, the more primitive of the people. Here we have a person sophisticated enough to be writing this psalm left with people who are basically, and I don't want to get in trouble here, in our time farmers can be highly sophisticated and highly trained, highly educated. In that time, it was not so. So in a way, it, it affirms my choice in the prologue to have one element that is at variance with the other elements. And here, the, the author, the writer of the psalm, is describing himself as at variance with the people, at least most of the people that he, is, that he has been left with. 
This may seem troubling because it seems to place responsibility for the degradation of the population in and around Jerusalem squarely on God. It does. And it also places responsibility for the invasion of the Babylonian army and for the deportation of the educated and trained classes of Jerusalem squarely on God. This is entirely consistent with the theology of the Old Testament, which I call the Hebrew Bible because that's what modern Jewish scholars prefer for it to be called. Like many people who are passionate about their religion, who are sincere in their religion, the writer of this psalm has a hard time reconciling his exalted understanding of God with the wreckage that he sees around him, the wreckage of the people whom he has loved. And that's when he says, God, what is a mortal soul that you gaze upon at the issue of a soul that you purpose it? A soul is like an exhalation whose days are like a passing shadow. And as he's reflecting on the frailty of those he has loved who have suffered so greatly, he is moved to rage. And now he is going to the imprecatory part of the psalm. God, ramp the cosmos and come down. Tap the mountains and make them royal. Like a volcano, smoke coming out of it. And in my opinion, these mountains are the mighty Babylonians who seem as immovable and as powerful as the mountains, but which are nothing compared to God. So he's talking about the Babylonians as these mountains, cast lightning bolts to scatter them. Suddenly he's going from mountains to maybe beasts that are shattered or frightened by lightning bolts. Shoot flaming arrows to, cons to consume them. And then he makes another transition. And now we get to what I think is the, the very heart of the psalm. Reach low to seize me and lift me from the maelstrom of the stranger whose mouth lies, whose right hand is guile. I don't think the strangers that he's referring to here, or the stranger, is simply somebody from another uh, nation or another land. Because he talks about the fact that their lips lie, their mouth tells lies, and their right hand is guile. It could have been translated lies or falsehood. I chose guile just for the... Um, for the uh, uh, assonance. Think about what a right hand is. I mean, when I was in junior high and probably you too, or maybe elementary school, we learned about opposing thumbs, the thing that made us capable of wielding tools and making things Certainly animals make things, beavers make things, bees make things, but our capacity to make things is so far beyond what, a, what an animal can do. It's what makes, one of the things that makes human beings exceptional in addition to language. But here you have two things. You have both, they, they lie with their language, with their lips, with their mouths, and they also, I mean, Falsehood is so fundamental to them that it is their manufacturing, it is their, their handiness, their cleverness. It's not just that they lie, they are lies. And I think this is something very primal. It goes back to the Tower of Babylon, and here we're talking, in my opinion, about something that has to do with Babylon. Remember that in Genesis, people were making this magnificent tower for themselves. 
and God came down and confused their language, alienated people from each other because they couldn't speak each other's language. I think here what he's saying is that that's what lies are. Next, he says, God, I will sing you a new song. I will extol you on the ten-string harp. Now remember, and then, and then he goes on to say, you saved kings, you set free your servant David from the wicked blade. Save me and set me free from the stranger's descendant whose mouth lies, whose hand is guile. So you have that phrase, whose mouth lies, whose hand is guile, sandwiching, as it were, it's the bread with the meat between them about this promise to sing God a new song, to extol God on the ten-string harp. Look at what, what's going on there. Singing a new song, mouth, lips, extol you on the ten-string harp. It's a harp. It's, it uses the hand, just like the, the villain, the, the, the evil one, uses his, his, his mouth, his lips, and his hand to lie. So this man uses his mouth and his hand to praise God. And it's a ten-string lyre. That is a, a string for every digit on both hands. So it is his whole commitment, his whole being to praising God. And remember, it's interesting, isn't it, how at the beginning of the psalm, we begin with hands and fingers. The psalmist says, God trains my hands to grapple and my fingers to battle. Maybe this praise is a battle that's going on inside his own heart. He yearns to praise God. And that's as sure a battle, that's as dramatic a battle as what may happen on the battlefield where his hands or his fingers hold a sword or a spear or grapple with the enemy. And this is in dramatic contrast to the, to the stranger, to the foreigner, to the alien, who is a stranger or a foreigner or an alien. Because instead of being committed to God, being committed to truth, he makes his way by lies. And, as, and lies alienate us from one another. There's one truth, there's one God, But to subjectivize these things, to subjectivize truth, to speak of my truth versus their truth, is to divide everybody from each other with a different truth. Now, not everybody who's seeking God, who's seeking truth, is going to agree. But it's that seeking that they have in common and a willingness to forfeit what they believe when they become convinced that they're wrong and to accept the truth as truth. And I think that's the fundamental point of this psalm, or one of the fundamental points. Now that he's gotten it off his chest, the psalmist turns to a more hopeful future. And that's what psalmists do when they go through times of disorientation. They look to the past to see and remember how God has blessed their ancestors. And they look to the future, hoping those times when God is powerful among them will return. And so here, he talks about the, um, the children uh, and their hopes for the children. May our sons be like seedlings stretching up in their youths. Seedlings are, a, in a sense, uh, representative of immortality. They're a way that a man and a woman can project themselves into the future, producing this seedling. And, and the reason for that is because you look at a tree, 
you look at for particularly an old growth tree like a sequoia up in uh, the Sequoia National Park, you're walking around there, you realize that that tree has been there for a long time. And in all probability, it will be there for a long time after you are gone. So it's not quite immortal, but good enough. It seems like it. And that's what a, a child is to a parent, at least as the psalmist here uses it. They are a way of him projecting himself into the future. This thing that he has begun, this seedling, it is something that they've begun. It will continue to grow long after they are gone. So that is, that in a sense represents immortality here. Then they go on to the daughter and they use a different metaphor for a daughter, perhaps in keeping with a different idea of the purpose of a daughter or the purpose of women. Because they use a metaphor, they use an architecturally very important item, a corner pillar of a great house. Um, some, some translations say uh, palace. I use great house because I want it to include temples because I think that's what the metaphor is all about. A temple represents the continuation of the perpetuation of knowledge of God. And a corner pillar is architecturally important, as I recall in the book of Job, when Satan sent a wind to destroy the house in which Job's children were feasting in order to kill them, the winds hit the corner pillars. And here they're carved corner pillars of this great house. And I think that not only represents the beauty of the daughters, but represents the effort that goes into making them excellent so that they can be this important element in the architecture of the social order. The psalmist moves on uh, from there to agricultural fecundity, that he's hoping for their future, uh, a fundamental for the prosperity of a society. You got to eat. And then he talks about, let us unburden our nobles, no breaches, no banishments, no weeping where we gather. He's remembering again what he's just been through, the hard times that have inspired this poem, this psalm. And then, as it were, there is a foot of the pillar. Glad are people ordered so. Glad are a people whose God is the Lord. Now that we've gone through the whole poem, we can look back at it and see that it has a structure to it. And that structure is basically a Mayan pyramid. That is, it follows a certain order up and then there's a long top, two elements of praise, and then it goes down the other side in the reverse order in which it went up. So I've got to say there's one element that makes it seem asymmetrical. I'll discuss that in a moment. But just to, just to list the elements, blessed is God my rock and so forth. Praise, that's how it starts. Um, then petition, God, ramp the cosmos and come down, and so forth. And then it talks about the stranger and his lies. After talking about the stranger and his lies, it praises again, or at least there's a promise of praise, and there's a promise of future praise, going on then to a remembrance of things past, a historical a praise based on history. So in other words, God, I will sing you a new song, and then you save kings, you set free your servant David. Then it once again discusses the stranger and his lies. Then it launches into a new set of petitions. And finally, ends with a praise. God, or excuse me, 
Glad are people ordered so. Glad are a people whose God is the Lord. Now, the one perplexing asymmetrical part of it is where the author slips into perplexity. God, what is a mortal soul for you to gaze upon it? The issue of a soul for you to purpose it. A soul is like an exhalation whose days are like a passing shadow. Maybe that's a praise. Maybe it's an implicit praise. The grandeur and the immortality of God contrasted with the vulnerability and the mortality of humanity. So that's one possibility. It also might be that he realizes that this episode, this something that approaches questioning the rightness of God's order is itself out of order. Or could it be that there is symmetry after all? Could it be that when the psalmist writes that God degrades my people under me, God, what is a mortal soul for you to gaze upon it? The child of a soul for you to purpose it. A soul is like a breath whose days are like a passing shadow that that's really um, that's really a lamentation about the fragility of humankind and the shortness of our lives and then you go that comes right after the initial praise and then just before the last praise the psalmist pleads, unburden our nobles, no breaches, no banishments, no weeping where we gather. The fact that he pleads against these things strongly suggests that they have been or are part of his life. And that sounds very much like a lamentation. So just after the first praise and just before the last praise, there is this spirit of lamentation part of a very variegated landscape of this psalm, variegated not unlike a human life. And maybe that's the point. Maybe the psalmist, in causing the reader to find order in what seemed to be disorder, he's inviting us to look at our perhaps messy seeming lives and find the divine order just as he in his own time of disorientation was able to find a divine order and express it in this symmetrical psalm. I think it's interesting that this poem is shaped like the ziggurat of Babylon, a structure which I suspect that the Tower of Babylon in Genesis was modeled after. It's a psalm that started with the praise of God and it ended with the praise of God, but it's interesting what it does not end with. At the beginning, it talks about how God made this man capable of combat. In the end, though, he's not asking, he or she is not asking for conquest over enemies. They want a life they want a society centered on God with abundance, with children, with freedom from fear, where truth is valued and God is in the midst of them. <laughs>